If you knew this was your last chance to address a group of students, what would you share with them? That is the question that will be answered today. Good afternoon, my name is Ashley Roberts and I am the Assistant Director of, in the Office of Student Involvement. Welcome to the fifth annual Last Lecture Series. Part of the Office of Student Involvement's mission is to complement and enhance the academic experience. With this program, we recognize faculty who complement and enhance students' learning beyond the classroom. This year, we received the strongest nominations yet from students to be considered for faculty to be considered for the last lecture speaker. Being nominated demonstrates the impact that faculty members have on the lives and development of their students and in the UMSO community. Nominated by Tracy Miller, this year's honoree is recognized for his multi-ethnic educational research in the St. Louis community. He currently resides in the College of Education as an associate professor. His passions include social justice, critical race theory, and equity in schooling. This year's honoree was nominated for his hard work ethic, deep insights, humility, passion, and authentic mentorship. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to this year's last lecture recipient, Dr. Matthew Davis. sister-in-law Paula Davis um, last week my mother asked me if I was gonna be nervous uh, today and I said no I don't think so I think I'll just cry a lot and, <laughs> and, and already I have begun um, let's see um, uh, I don't I don't lecture particularly and so this is a this is a, a, a bizarre occurrence for me I, I'm uh, uh, I'm I'm awed by the folks that can can lecture. That's a skill that that uh, I think very few uh, really really good teachers have, and, and it's certainly one I've not uh, not fostered or, or done well with. I'm a I'm a uh, seminar leader, and uh, it's just a, it's a different world. And so uh, this probably is my fourth PowerPoint presentation that I put together, maybe fifth. I uh, had to learn how to do new things. Uh, Tracy had to had to hold my hand and, and uh, put my hand in new new direction to, to try to figure out what what to do. Um, let's see here. Um, okay. Uh, again, this is this is uh, extra special for me to to be here to, to give this talk. Uh, I can only imagine that the title uh, uh, surprised and shocked many of you. I think for most of my students, they were underwhelmed probably by my title. Um, first, let me let me mention that we will we'll begin with um, I'll begin uh, with a discussion about what the title means. Uh, uh, we'll uh, talk a little bit about this question about the last lecture. Give a little uh, introduction about uh, a little interlude about uh, liberation as end in view. This is one of the problems I think we have in, in, in the academy and out in, in the public, understanding the difference between social justice and racial justice. 
uh, and whether we're we're, uh, we're we're seeking liberation or whether we can actually have a liberation and end in view and have something that, that we can actually see. Uh, and then getting here and here, and I'll describe that in a second, and then a few takeaways. I'm, I, uh, I've fretted over 45 minutes. I can't imagine that I'll be here this long. Um, okay. I think most of you can recognize this picture. Uh, it's not that I've carried Tiki Torts. I'm not sure I've even, I think I've sat around Tiki Torts before. I, I know what they are, but this is uh, uh, in large measure to say I act in racist ways, both large and small, just as these folks do. There's a, a famous book many of you know called White Like Me by Tim Wise. I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not Tim, and so I decided I couldn't, I couldn't steal his title, and so I White Like Them. This is a, and so let me describe this a bit to you. One. Uh, this is not to say my ancestors, my ancestors uh, held slaves, although they probably did. They came through the South, 80% of Southerners. Ah, it's not, my, my clicker didn't, didn't click. Ah, 80% of Southerners owned slaves. That's not why, I'm, uh, why I say white like them. It is, though, am I, now I'm getting myself uh, mixed up. It is that I want to be stay present with my white supremacist sense of uh, sociability. We're taught to be racist. I want to be clear about this. This isn't just our our uh, our socialization. We're taught through our curriculum how to be racist. Now, that's a that's a tough thing to say. That's certainly a tough thing to to hear. Let me continue on. And what it represents, though, is my desire to not be defensive about this. We can't change. We can't. We can't grow. We can't. We can't. Where am I? Where did I? Where did I? Ah, there we go. Hopefully, I'll get where my left and right hands do the same thing. Sorry, folks. Uh, so I want to. I want to be able to. I want us to lose this defensiveness about whether we're racist or not. We are. Okay, I have, a, I have a really good friend who I don't think could be here uh, this afternoon and, a, and a, a current student who has two questions for us whenever this, whenever this arises. And these questions are, what if it were true? What would you do differently? I hope this afternoon and later as days go along. You remember these two questions. They continue to guide me. Uh, uh, yeah, they're very important questions for me. Uh, and I, yeah, good. Um, okay, yes, I'm the colonizer. The subtitle I didn't do quite as well. Um, uh, we needed to have a little longer title. I have come up though with, a, with an alternative title for some of you. And I'm a gladiator, why aren't you? Now, the apologies to those of you that are not fans of Scandal. Um, I, uh, I think in, a, in, a, in, in another life, I'll, Olivia Pope will, will be my employer. But uh, I'm a gladiator, why aren't you? Um, so, um, let's see if I can uh, figure out how to Last lecture. Okay, here's this question that that our uh, the introducer told us about. Um, it's a question that doesn't didn't quite ring with me. The question, though, that every student that I that I teach eventually come to is, <laughs> how the heck did you get here? Now, here is not geographic. Here here is theological or ontological. Really is asking, how the heck did you get here in front of me at this place and this time? Right? I I have a partial answer to that, and I'll and I'll uh, deal with. But I, I also want, for the first time, I've really thought more about what here is, and so I want to talk about to what I what I do in the classroom, so that and it's it's something that many of you do. 
but it's it's a it's a set of things that I've had to learn. Uh, I think the hard way, the hard way. Hopefully, others will learn more in a more easy easy fashion. Now, my interlude. This end in view, liberation end in view. Um, recently, uh, Washington University um, announced that they were they were they were setting up a new diversity academy. And if you'll notice, I've, I've highlighted the last three adjectives. They leave with, and we all do a social justice. We want us to be welcoming, we want us to be equitable, we want us to be inclusive. But we keep leaving our audiences with those sentences, with those adjectives. What does that mean? Where does that mean we want to be? So racial justice, in my mind, and liberation, I take from a, a quotation from a, a very fine scholar, Dwight McBride. And, and the, his, his idea is, if there are enough, if, if we could hire enough, if we could hire as many mediocre blacks as we do mediocre whites in academia, we'd have liberation. <laughs> now, this is partly tongue-in-cheek and joking, but it's really oh. true. This is, um, uh, we, we, uh, we look for exceptional in individuals, but we're not looking deep enough and far enough wide for, for those that can enrich our lives and enrich the institutions in which we live. So, how did I get here? I was, I, I was, I grew, I was born in 1960. Oh, let me say, I, I should have said, uh, I'm, I'm, how, 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 do I, how do I forget that this is my mother's birthday? This is being held on my mother's birthday. Yeah, shame on me. Rich uh, uh, environment to, to grow up in. Um, I had, as you'll as you'll meet and, and get to know them, they're good white liberal parents for all of that all that that means. Um, I grew up in Austin, Texas, and it's what we what we like to call the liberal oasis of Texas. But I put this in in if you'll notice, I put this in italics. The bloom is off the rose for Austin, for me, and I think for lots of folks. Uh, recently, we've had the, the bombings and uh, the uh, post office bombings in Austin. We found out that Austin is not the nice town that we thought it was. It's a hostile and mean town for folks of color. We've been pushing people out of Austin since the 1920s. I think Austin may be the largest city with the lowest population, lowest percentage of folks of color. Don't know that I didn't check that I didn't check that out, but I, I think we're com coming close. But we thought of ourselves as good liberals, and it, in a lot of ways, it is the most liberal place in Texas. Uh, it, uh, but it's it does have a deep south part uh, part of of of, uh, of its own. Now, part of this long 1960s is that um, race was present in my home and neighborhood. Now, I don't want to overdo this. There weren't gangs in my neighborhood. I didn't join gangs. I didn't have a black mother or a black father, an other mother. I did have a best friend who was black, but as many of us did. Um, uh, and continue to have, right? Um, but let me, let me mention a couple features of this race as president in my, in my home and neighborhood. My dad had his graduate students out, out to our house often. My dad probably mentored more doctoral students of color at the University of Texas at Austin while he was there. Maybe even since. It was a profound experience that my dad had and, and the impact that he had on folks of color at, at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and they had an impact on us as well. Next. This can sound trite, but I had a I had a black male principal in high school. Here was this very respected man, or at least as I knew, on both sides of the color line in this city in Austin. Uh, and this again is a, is a high school in the South with a black principal. He and he he practiced what I later came to understand as Tom Peters management by walking around. Some of you know it. Most good principals know it. 
he was out in the middle in the hallways in between every bell and so we got to know who he was and so I four years I had this three-dimensional robust recognition of what a black male could be in my life very different than most of us who live in the south um, although my getting here is limited I, I don't I don't know it well let me say too the next thing is that um, that as as present as race was and as I go too far um, race was also distant um, I think I, we did not live in an integrated neighborhood. We had two black families. Um, yes, my best friend's father was a dentist. Another couple, there were a professor and an attorney. They were present, but distant. Two, and this is one of those things that I have a, I've had a really hard time struggling with understanding. We were a family that watched the television a lot. We watched all the sports that were happening. My brother and I got up on every Saturday afternoon and watched what was it, what were the sports we were talking about yesterday. We also watched one, uh, the nightly news on NBC every night. We watched 60 Minutes weekly. We saw the fire hosing. We saw the, the dogs. We saw the raised fists at Mexico City. But what I don't remember is any sort of an oral memory. And I'm, and I'm struck by, and I still haven't figured out what that means, but I'm struck by that, that this is somehow significant, that it was visual but not oral. Now, psychologists who are my colleagues, maybe you can figure out what, I've, what, I've, what I'm uh, not figuring out here, but there's something there that, that is, uh, that's sticking with me. But we watched, and I remember in in relatively positive fashion about the protesters. Again, this was a South that wanted to lynch Martin Luther King on every corner, not in our neighborhood. Okay, um, now, I said this is partial, so I'm gonna jump to graduate school because in between there was lots of mess <laughs> uh, in my life. Um, uh, I had several teachers of color. This was this was again extraordinary for for even the 1990s. I know folks who can go through this institution and never have a, a professor of color. It's remarkable. It's 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 uh, demeaning, uh, but it is true. One major mentor, um, and I'll have in a second say more about him. Uh, finally. I had a dissertation topic in which I studied a biography of an Anglo-American, the first Anglo who researcher of Mexican American education. I, I, I became an adult. I learned how to write. I learned how to think. I, the dissertation meant everything to me. This one mentor at the end of my defense turns to me and says, do you like Mr. Manuel? <laughs> This is still a, a very important uh, memory for me. Uh, and of course, I, I answered, oh yes, yes. I, I've come to identify with who he was. And, uh, and he said, I don't think I do. It took me a long time to understand what he meant and I knew it. I knew something was important. I knew, you know, when you, somebody says something and you think, uh oh, I'm gonna have to sit with this for a while. He was saying, this man was not the ally that you thought he was. Uh, that was a, that was a, uh, I had people around me who were very upset at him for having said that. Uh, but it was an important thing for me to understand and, and, and recognize that allyship is, a, is, a, is, is really a, a negotiated affair. Uh, becoming an ally is, is uh, is work that has to be done deliberately and and with heartache every day. So I came to understand that I was a, I was studying allyship across the color line, uh, and uh, that that uh, the richness of what I mean by becoming an ally has 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 
has changed and morphed throughout the time. Now, if I can settle myself again, um, let's see here. Um, where am I? Okay. Now, post PhD, um, my first let's see, my first major research effort was studying the state agents of Negro education. This is a this is an archaic term. But I use it deliberately because it was the time, it was it was the it was the ways in which they understood. Thanks. Uh, I probably should have asked for this long ago. Um, uh, the state agents were white men who oversaw black education in the South from roughly 1900 to 1950. Um, they weren't allies. I thought they were when I was studying them. Um, uh, uh, but when I when I started teaching critical race theory, I found out no, they're not the the, the allies that I, that I thought they were. Now this next line that that some of you saw just a second ago, I know that some of you were thinking, now now what happened to Mexican American education? Because most of us, when we leave graduate school, we move into a topic that's well, okay. We may slide a little bit. We may move a little bit. We usually don't completely changed direction. And in good white supremacist action, I look back and I realized in my schooling, 12 years in Texas, all the way through college and graduate school, I had decided not to learn Spanish. So I took the privilege to change my topic. Now, this is after the fact I'm saying I can recognize the ways in which this played out in white supremacist action. But it, it is iconic in which um, I, have a, I have, as a white male, I, I move into an institution, I have, I have privilege to do virtually whatever I want. So I picked up on something new. I'm not gonna go backwards and learn Spanish. Backwards, learning Spanish. Uh, it's an incredible thing to, to, to wrap your mind around. Um, and then, uh, another remarkable thing, and it, it sounds very, very simple, but at age 43 I read my first black novel. This is, uh, um, I was having a conversation with, with Dr. Earth this morning. Um, uh, empathy, for many of us, comes through our reading of fiction. And let me give you two pieces of, of, of context to, to this simple fact of reading my first black novel at, at age 43. And that is, one of those is I read a book a day when I got out of graduate school. I had, I, uh, and, and I read lots of novels. The first black novel. I had become what I understood was a, to be an expert in the education of black folks <laughs> without knowing about the interiority of their lives. Think about this again. Becoming an expert, supposed an expert, without knowing the interiority of their lives. Uh, it, it's, uh, it was a profound event for me. I didn't, uh, um, I was losing some eyesight, and so when I went to the bookstore to pick up a, 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 a pair of reading glasses, I saw The Invisible Man and said, I think I need to read that. Well, I'm sorry I needed to learn. <laughs> okay, let's see, where, where, uh, oh, I have gone, I've gone too far ahead, haven't I, again? Um, no, I haven't, okay. I am, this is a little bit off. Okay, here, I teach racially integrated classrooms. Now this is, this on a, on a campus like, like UMSL, it's easy to think about what is, well let's, let's think about what a racially integrated uh, classroom is. Often in K-12, in the area that I know most about, if it's 10% black, we think it's pretty integrated, right? My neighborhood had two black families, not integrated. But 10% but maybe? Integrated. Now, this is the third white, two thirds folks of color. 
even as they finish, and I've finished almost 50 doctoral advisees, I still keep this third white, two thirds folks of color in my class. Now, these classrooms are different than the ones I learned in. The ways in which folks relate to one another across the color line in that sort of density is different. Now, how did I come to do it? How did that, how did that happen? Um, I practice what I first call racially uh, realistic curriculum. And, and so I start with critical race theory. Foundational to critical race theory is that racism is persistent, pervasive, and isn't going away. So what does that mean in the classroom? So uh, I, as much as I love Beverly Tatum, right? Uh, black, uh, why are the black folks sitting in the classroom together? It's 25 years old. I don't want to talk about, I don't want to teach about disproportionality anymore. We know about disproportionality. Why is it happening? We have 25 years of scholarship, mainly from folks of color that we don't read, that are, have told us, oh, who, who, have, who have more elegantly described what Beverly Tatum had did 25 years ago. So, racial, uh, racial realism in pedagogy. First thing, uh, where to go, um, is recognize new sorts of brilliance. This sounds really simple. We're an institution that demands the GRE to get into graduate school. The GRE was implemented at, at Southern institutions of higher learning to keep blacks out. That we know the GRE is poor is a poor uh, measure of intelligence and promise, but we continue to use it. We need to find new ways to recognize brilliance. Let's see if one way is the privilege uh, counter stories. This is another tenet of critical race theory that we can't we can't continue to listen to the master narrative in any discipline and expect nor hope to change what we're teaching nor have students listen to us. So privileging counter stories both in the curriculum and in pedagogy. So as a good southern white male, I was taught we protected white women, right? Southern chivalry, not in the classroom. This is not, I don't mean to be hostile to white women, but if black women need to voice their story that is different, I can't have white women shouting down black women. We must privilege counter, -privilege, counter stories. Next, practice uh, aspirational allyship. I coined this term, or at least want to popularize this term with, with Tracy in an article manuscript that hasn't gotten published yet. But that we keep two things in mind with aspirational allyship. One is that it's always a journey, right? I'm never a complete ally. I never, I'm, I'm always slipping down from being an ally. Second, if I once assert I'm an ally, I lose folks understanding me to be an ally. This is a, this is a, a aspirational allyship is, is perhaps the, the reach that we can make, it. unless we're somebody like Tim Wise, and I'm not Tim Wise. Um, uh, let's see. Next, 
Aha, there we go. Um, can I get? Sorry, folks. I'm slowing up again on my uh, on my own computer, and I'm not sure all of what is going on. Okay, race talk is violent. How many of y'all have have had an instructor had a had a had a um, uh, a lesson leader who who started a conversation by saying, "We're going to make this a safe space for everyone, right? <laughs> We're going to close the doors." No. Race talk is always violent. How can we talk about something that is has has been as horrific in this country? as racism and it not be violent. The article that's referenced here is entitled Pedagogy of Fear. We do this so that we can be safe for white people. For black folks, racial talk is always violent. I've seen some nods. Um, so the last thing uh, is that emotion must be in the classroom. Here's another one. How many folks have said, have, have heard the statement at, at the beginning of a talk about race that said, let's keep emotion out of it, right? Just the facts. How in the heck do we talk about race and it not be emotional? We need people to get angry, allow them to get angry, allow them to cry, allow them to, 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 to joyously bond across the color line, whatever. Emotion has to be present. Some of us have to relearn how we teach. Um, okay. Now, a small number of takeaways. I think I've gone a little faster than I did in my practice. <laughs> First, we are on what's what we commonly call the predominantly white institution, right? PWI. Let's not forget that this institution, like all PWIs, um, that the hallways and classrooms and byways of this institution is not only hostile but at times horrific for people of color. It's what PWI is. It's white supremacist at its running. Now, I don't blame the institution for being that way. We've, we've, I do blame it. <laughs> I, but I blame us for having become that and not making the changes. Um, uh, now, let's go what did I, what were my uh, two questions earlier? Hmm? What if it were true? What would we do differently? This is, at the, at the beginning of the 21st century, in an institution that is struggling with its, its racial issues, maybe not as bad as our flagship institution, but we're struggling. Let's try to think about what we can do differently. Next, I learned this the hard way um, a few weeks ago. Partnership is hard. Uh, some of you may remember the, the movie An American President, where Michael Douglas gets up and talks about uh, American citizenship demands a lot from us. Partnership is tough. We have to sacrifice. I found I was not being the partner that I needed to be. I lost a project which I thought was mine, but it wasn't mine. It was others, and it wasn't mine. Being a partner is hard. We must do differently. Next, see black children as human beings. This is a really hard thing to say, have to come in your mouth and to think about. Let's have a thought experiment. Experiment. If we treated black children as bad, or if we treated white people, white children as badly as we treated black children in school, what? Oh, that wouldn't happen, would it? Mm -hmm. 
wouldn't do it. Treat them as human beings. Now, unless some of you believe that this is simply another Black Lives Matter, let's recognize that there's a soaring suicide rate for black students, student, uh, student age, and that social deaths are, are increasingly happening in the classroom for black kids. Thus, unfortunately, as we move further into the 21st century, school time is the new middle passages for black children. Thank you. like I'm doing in this lecture. No, I, I, uh, I have a, I have, uh, I have a very bad answer for you. I, I, uh, as a, as a, uh, I opt out. I don't, I don't, I don't ramp up my discussion about white supremacy. I ask folks, this is one of the, I make sure I meet with students before they get into my classroom. I don't want any surprises and I don't want defensiveness to keep us from growing. Now, it, it's a it's a uh, it's a cop out, and and I'm and I'm encounter I encounter this I encounter um, um, this this one friend who in particular who asked these two major questions about what if it were true and what would I do differently. Uh, she regularly asks me, so how are you doing with white folks? Uh, I. Um, uh, I don't do well, so I don't. I, I don't have an answer for you about how to do it with defensive people. Um, uh, I'm hoping that people can get past their defenses before they get to me. Uh, again, I have to mea culpa. Uh, it's a. Uh, uh, it's a. It's a bad answer. I'm sorry. I wish I had a better one for you. Others may have may have a better answer for you. Uh, uh, the defensiveness is tough. I, 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 I'm, uh, I, I remain hopeful that my that my modeling of <laughs> of uh, not being defensive will break down some barriers. Uh, that's aspirational. That's that's theological for sure. I'm not uh, I'm not at all sure that's a confidence uh, confidence talking. Yes, Carol. So I took one of your classes and had an experience that I believe and hope I will always remember um, but because it was a young white woman who said out loud in the discussion that her fear and the fear of many people that she knew was that if white people were held accountable for the things that have happened in the United States, we would come get them with a vengeance. 
She didn't say it quite that way. No. But that's what I was left with. So my question to you is, one, you talk about creating safe spaces. How on earth do we create a space that safe for students? I don't think it, the rest of the world? I, I think safety is a chimera. I think we're, I think we're, uh, I think we're uh, at maybe Sisyphus trying to roll the, the boulder up. I, I don't think it's possible to, to, for it to be safe. I think we have to recognize it and come to grips with it. Then I think some of the violence is is um, is measurably dropped if we if we all come to recognize the violence of the, of the talk. But um, uh, it's just it's never safe. Yes. Yes. Well, that's a uh, that's that's wow wow. Thank you for thank you for the zinger of a question. Um, this is um, I, this is back to I think we we misunderstand doing about co curriculum. I can't I can't give up. No, I can't give up uh, my uh, my ownership of the classroom. Uh, it is I'm being account I'm accountable to the institution. Um, now there are some things that I that I can do differently uh, that that are are extremely difficult. One is I try to bite my tongue, uh, and and I don't do it often enough. But I try to bite my tongue. As a as a dissertation advisor, probably the very hardest thing I have to do, but it's been very deliberate from from day one. I have I. My dad bled over papers. I know some, many of you understand what bleeding on papers mean. I can't do that. This is not to mean that I, that I relinquish my job as, as arbiter of some academic excellence. But if, if counter stories are paramount, and if, I'm, if I want counter stories to shine in our profession, I can't shut down a voice. Editing is colonizing. Right? Think about this. Editing is colonizing. Now I again I that's a that's a terribly difficult navigation uh, uh, road to navigate. Um, uh, I worry constantly that my colleagues think uh, that I am that I'm dumbing down the curriculum or something like it because I don't do the editing that, that some of my colleagues do. Um, I lost being an ally to a, to a very fine student who uh, near the beginning of her defense, uh, my fifth year of, of teaching the, the doctoral community, I excised a big portion of woman's thought out of her dissertation because I didn't think it would make it through the graduate school. She let me know and let everyone else around me know that I had done her grievous harm. Now, it got back in, she published her book, and she's, a, she's an incredible scholar, but I lost my chance to be an ally. Uh, editing's tough. That's, so that's one of the things that, that I, that I, that I do. Uh, it, it's a constant, um, it's a constant battle. But it's always, but, I, but I'm always present that I'm that I'm the white guy in the middle of class. I, the, uh, it does nobody good, nobody any good. I, yes, I slip up and say we, us, and we, right? In in, uh, in inappropriate times, when I'm thinking that maybe I'm not quite as white as I am, uh, uh, nobody's a fool, nor especially not not me. But uh, it happens. It's tough. Yes. Hello. Yes. <coughs> God knows I hope I still work here. <laughs> At my age, please. Uh, well, my question is, uh, what, if any, steps have you 
talking about what to, to most of us feels like common common stuff, but to them may seem like really radical. Yeah. I've I've had very good luck. I've not had I've not had any uh, I've not had any uh, uh, No prohibitions, no, no uh, slap on the hands, no nothing. Um, uh, some of that is that I don't think, I think most of my students, I don't know that too many of my students have written letters of, of complaints. I, I, there have been a couple of complaints. And I've, I've been slapped a couple of times on the hand, but lightly. Uh, but, um, but usually if, I'm, if I can sit and talk with either my dean at the time or uh, I have, uh, then uh, there's usually, that, that gets worked out. Now, that doesn't mean I don't carry anxiety all the time <laughs> that uh, just just as I said, God, I hope this isn't my last lecture. Mm -hmm. I, uh, this is, this is probably, this is clearly the most public that I've been and if this, I'm, I, uh, I think we're going to put this up on YouTube, and I'm not so sure about that. But, um, it is, uh, but uh, no, I'm scared. Uh, but um, um, we have the privilege to be scared, and and uh, it's white folks usually are not fired over this stuff. It's it's black folks that are fired over saying the things that I'm saying. Usually, yes. <laughs> University can be at the forefront of uh, encouraging dialogue. I would hope so. And justice among community members. And so what can students, faculty, and administrators do? What can we do? Well, I think in the College of Education, I think we've we've had we've had some some really important beginning uh, discussions. Uh, our colleague Dr. Morris here has been uh, right up front pushing us to have these conversations. Uh, we must continue those. Uh, um, uh, and conversations they have to stay now we, we, we're not uh, yes there's a lot to talk about we, we talk much about faculty governance faculty are not governing in the, in, in the ways in which we can change the institution yes hi yes Right. And experiencing what you've experienced, and you know, seeing that oh, sure. all these things that we are talking about are research documented in a book, okay? And then living your life and seeing things with this set of glasses on that's different than most. Right. How do you take care of self so that you don't like explode <laughs> on a regular basis because you're seeing something you. that, okay, what everybody did that 40 years ago? And it's still happening. Okay, we all knew that this is what's happened to children 40 years ago, but we're still doing that anyway. And saying, we don't know what happened. Good. I, I didn't didn't say and didn't um, uh, what has become much more important to me in my teaching in the last three years, two years, in particular with help with folks like Sean. Nick, uh, Sean, uh, this is a uh, uh, self care is incredibly important. I we can't. We can't dwell in the, we can't wallow in the in the messiness of race from this country without finding ways to self care. Now, we self care can include care from others, but we have to begin with self care. Um, I uh, this I mentioned this um, uh, where I where I I. Uh, I found out I was not a partner uh, a few weeks ago. I've had to grieve. Um, I had to. I had to recognize that I that uh, even though I was wrong, that I my that I had to grieve, and so I had to. I had to allow myself to sleep extra. I had to. I, this is simple. For those of you that have gone through depression, you understand. You you sleep, and and so. Uh, that's just one of the things. I, I absolutely self care is tremendously important. Uh, uh, these things matter to us. Uh, we can't be the gladiators on the front line if we're if and, and not and not and not hurt. 
Um, I when I the I remember the morning I woke up and said I uh, my own liberation is in, in is tied up with the liberation of my students and uh, uh, it's tough. Self care is important. Good. Thank you. Yes. So. Um like I've been to a mostly white high school, for example, and of course I'm here at Umso now. And um, like through my class experiences, I've of course gotten a mostly white perspective on things such as history. Sure. Um, the master narrative. Yeah, the, pretty much. And even even now, I have it's still the same. Is there's still there are opportunities to sh share sometimes, but it's still like for the most part. Sure restricted so how would you say like yes. what would you suggest to your colleagues to um, like or not what would you suggest but do you talk speak with your colleagues on maybe how they can add more uh, relevant uh, relevant details or relevant subjects to their um, curriculums that may work for all the students or at least most of them I, I appreciate your question no I, I uh, um, uh, one, uh, uh, most of us as professors are, are uh, we're entrepreneurial, and we, we like to think we're the experts, and I don't like other people particularly telling me what to do or not to do, and I know that my colleagues don't necessarily like to be told what to do and what not to do. Now, yes, it, it's, it's, um, Things like relearning my profession by reading scholars of color. Um, I um, I didn't read uh, even even uh, and I read very few scholars of color even in in in, uh, in my graduate classwork. Uh, that's not something that's common. It certainly wasn't in the 90s. May be coming more common, and I hope it is. Um, but I had to re-educate myself. I, I can, but even to say that to a colleague sounds uh, patronizing at best. Now, I've I've had some colleagues who have come to me. I have some very important colleagues who have 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 uh, have been vulnerable and allowed themselves to ask me, uh, and and I, they they appreciate my voice and and I'm I, I'm uh, I go away from those. Those interactions, uh, they're rare, and but when they come across, I, I, I'm, I'm dumbfounded and, and almost paralyzed for half a day because it's, it's, it's so nice to hear that, that, and it's, it, it's important that we, that we talk to other colleagues. I, I, I wish I did it more often. Maybe my, maybe my dean will push me to do more. Yes. I appreciate your passion. Thank you. I knew there was a bus there coming. <laughs> but even on this level, right. most of us, we get sure. on this level. Sure, sure. But how do you have those race talks with the leadership of the university? Because it's not like you're just a white person talking to But that's above my pay grade. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, uh, UMSL is, um, uh, 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 UMSL suffers under way too many white folks at the top. No question. I, I've said this in other kinds of places, in other ways. Uh, we have, we have, uh, the, the institution has done a, uh, is beginning to do uh, a partial job at opening up to faculty members. We're not doing a good job of, at retention of faculty members at all. We certainly are not doing a good job of, of recruiting senior administrators. I, again, I don't think this is anything most of us don't know. I'm, I, I, but, it, but seriously, by my pay grade, faculty governance is way over, over uh, rationalized. 
and there is. Uh, I certainly want us to have as much input as we can, uh, but when we're asked for input, I'm never sure that we're actually getting the opportunity to have that input that, that we could. So, I, I'll admit it, another cop out, sorry. Yes? Dr. Davis, what advice do you give to those that have spoken up for black people and for all people to be, to be as a matter of fact, but labeled an angry black woman? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What advice would you give that person? I, I would, um, oh boy, <laughs> advice on, on so, so let's see. Uh, Sherry Turkleman has a uh, uh, has some, a great series of books on on uh, uh, taking on new animation characters and as a as a white male online becoming a black woman and all of that. Kind of, I, I I can tell a black woman how to be no I, I <laughs> and the best I can do is to offer uh, a scholarship by by other women of color who are trying to break down that most Harris-Perian sister citizen is probably the icon, iconic for me on helping to understand. And I, and I, think, I think many black women have found that a helpful. And, and there's, uh, uh, I, so I'm, I think I need, I have to, I, I, have, to, I have to use the tools I have and put, put scholars in front of them. Uh, who have who have the, the authentic, uh, authenticity to say to you what they mean? Does that does that help? So a good example would be your crooked group conference that's coming up. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, it will be. Uh, uh, I I want to encourage everyone to go. It's going to be at the BJC Commons, uh, be held on June 9th. Please go. It, it's going to be an incredible. Uh, conference. Uh, it's not going to be here though any longer. Uh, it may, uh, who knows? Maybe at a time uh, it may. Uh, the young women are, are taking it in directions that are just profound. So, absolutely. Thank you. Did I miss one, two? No. I'm, maybe we're at the end of Yes. Okay. So, all one. Yours will be more equal, but it seems like it's all stacked up against itself. attack is, is ourselves, I suppose, to be silly about it. Um, as, a, as someone who studies schools, I'm no, I'm, I've given up on, on school districts. I have a colleague who, 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 uh, who hasn't, but I'm, I'm at least one. I'm, uh, I, I've given up on school districts as a place for reform in this measure. It's too, they're too diverse, they're too, uh, they're too big. Um, Schools and good principles are, are the places in which uh, I think meaningful reform can take place. This, though, is a uh, is is a question I hope we continue to to, to raise. Uh, I hope at some point districts or uh, uh, I hope someone can bring districts back in to my vision on what can be what can be reformable. But districts are too big in my mind. So the school level is is probably the, the largest that I can imagine. Yes, they're good. So uh, Prairie talks about uh, the oppressor, and the, yeah. the oppressor can never free himself. But, and so you know you you talked about colonization. So how do you how do you go about approaching that? Either decolonizing? How do you you know? Uh, specifically, since you are in a position of institutional power and authority, 
Oof, I wish I had power and authority in this institution. <laughs> now, well, I have authority over my students, and I have to, I have to keep recognizing that that's that's a that's certainly a colonizing. Uh, that's that's where I enter the colonizing uh, enterprise is that I have authority over students. Uh, um, uh, so, I, uh, Freire is. I, 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 who am I to say Freire is wrong? He's right. Uh, uh, I can't free myself. I can. Uh, I can hope that. That. Um, and again, this has to. For, for me, this has to become a theological quest. It's not. Uh, 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 I've had a number of students who have helped me recognize that. Uh, that that my uh, my aim for liberation of other, of students and of myself. Is, is unlikely to come in my lifetime, not to be Martin Luther King-esque and say, I can see them. No, I, it's, uh, I can hope and, and have to continue to have theological hope that this, is, this will take place. Um, uh, part of this is always recognizing the ways in which I am the colonist. I, 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 I have to be present with that, I think. I, and that's the simplest answer I can give, and it's it's incomplete, but thank you. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you all again for coming out for the last lecture series and Dr. Nate. We do have a reception that we will follow. There's a nice spread back there. I know there are several former classmates and uh, students and kids yes. and other guests. So please feel free not just today, but hereafter, and share what you've learned from this conversation. Um, we do have some last lecture nominees who are in here. We do have uh, certificates for you of recognition, so if you please stop by our table when you enter. Um, as you exit, we can give you those, otherwise we'll deliver them to the field. Again, thank you on behalf of the Office of Student Involvement for participating in our last lecture series and our work week. We have a lot of other events going on, so 